when I was growing up, I, I used to spend my summers at a, a camp um, where I had the chance to, uh, to learn how to do whitewater kayaking as an activity. Um, we were on a lake, so there was really nothing to do but learn how to roll. But eventually, as I gained some skills, uh, I was able to go on a trip from the camp. We drove a couple of hours uh, with the kayaks and go to an actual river to see real rapids. Um, and after doing this for a couple of years, I had the chance to go on a little bit more of an advanced trip uh, to a, a more raging river and to, to face bigger rapids and faster water. And so these, these rapids were a lot bigger than what I was used to. And as, as soon as you put your kayak in, you kind of paddle over this, uh, not quite a waterfall, but it's a, a big chute of water. Um, tons of fun. And after this, there are four or five holes, these features in a river that, that are called holes. Um, and, and one after the other, you, you can paddle through them or you can stay in and play in them. Um, but one of the reasons that um, it took a couple of years before they invited me to, to go on this bigger river is because there are, there are two kinds of holes on a, on a river in a rapid. The first kind is, is a lot of fun. You can paddle into it and you can surf it kind of like a wave uh, in your kayak. And there are kayaks designed specifically to sit in these and do tricks that are about this long uh, and very hard to get into, um, but it's a lot of fun. But the second kind of hole isn't fun at all, uh, really. It's, it has a stronger current, um, and it, um, it keeps pushing you upstream. And when you're, when you're sitting in a kayak looking downstream, all of the holes look basically the same. There's a little bit of a drop, and then you can see some, some foamy white water, the kind of thing that excites me and might scare some of you. Mike and I can go do that ourselves. Um, but these second kinds of holes, these dangerous holes, are, are different. Um, because you can, you can try to paddle out of them, but the current on the surface of the water um, stretches so far past the drop that it keeps pushing you upstream, even while the water going down this little drop pushes you downstream. And so you can get caught in these. Uh, it's why man-made dams are, are so dangerous, because they're designed to create this hole that circulates water and keeps stuff there underwater. Well, these rapids that we would go to, this bigger one, they had one really, really bad hole. And it stretched across probably three quarters of the river. So you had to paddle far to one side to avoid it. But this hole looked so calm, so gentle. And it probably only dropped, you know, a couple of inches or centimeters. Um, from Epp River, it certainly looked like it, it was the calmest part of the river so far. After going down this, this big chute and, and, and pushing ourselves through these four or five big holes, it looked like the easiest feature that we had come across. And unless my leader had warned me first, I would have paddled right into it, only finding out when it was too late uh, that I had paddled into what, you know, what they called the death hole. Um, it wasn't actually that dangerous, but um, it was not fun. Even after the warning, the first time I came across this hole, I, I looked at it and I, I thought to myself, That's, that looks pretty easy. That must not be as bad as they said. Um, but one time, somebody's boat got stuck in it and I paddled down into it to bump the boat out of the hole and, and I was stuck there for a couple of minutes trying to slowly work my way out of this thing. So um, the, the point is that um, at every step down the way, my leader continued to remind us what was coming that this hole might not look dangerous, but it really was. And so eventually, you know, the first couple of times I went, I listened to his warning, because uh, what looked like in my head something um, easy was actually very dangerous. The, the letter of Jude was written also as a warning, kind of like what my leader gave me. Right? False teachers had slipped into Christian congregations um, scattered around the, the ancient world. It doesn't tell us exactly where he's writing, but we know that these kind of false teachers were, were prevalent um, towards the end of the, the time when the New Testament was written. And so Jude is, is warning the churches about them because like a, a bad hole on a river, sometimes the danger isn't clear until it's too late. So Jude is, is sounding warning bells in the churches, and, and he challenges them to contend for the faith. Since the time Jude was written, these false teachers haven't gone away. They, they've continued to attach themselves to the church. And they're not always easy to spot, even though their presence is a, a very negative influence on the, the very health and hope of the church. 
And so as believers today, we, we still need to be able to see the danger and diagnose the disease of false teaching before it's too late. So Jude's warnings and encouragements then are, are for us today also to learn from uh, so that we can keep ourselves, like he says, in the love of God and to, so that we can contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. So I, I want to take just a couple of weeks to, to go through Jude to, to hear his warnings and, and to take a hold of his encouragements because uh, they're, they're here for us to learn from. Um, this week, we're, we're going to take time to look closely at uh, the warnings he gives. And next week, we'll look a little more closely at, at diagnosing the disease and, and treating uh, the disease. Uh, so with this in mind, with uh, looking at the warnings, I just want to read uh, the first section of Jude's letter from uh, verse 1 uh, to verse 13. So if you, if you have a Bible, you can um, follow along, and if you don't, the words will be up on the screen. This is from Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write, appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Now, I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also, relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blaspheme, blaspheme the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people, they blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning, unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain, and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear. They're shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. They're wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever." This is God's word. It's just the first 13 verses of, of this short letter uh, written by someone named Jude, someone who introduces himself to us as the brother of James. He introduces himself also as a slave or a servant of Jesus Christ. And as we kind of ask who this, who this man is, we can, we can find out by asking ourselves who, who James is. And there were, there were two important people named James around this time in the church. Uh, the first was James, the disciple of Jesus, the, the brother of John. But he was executed by Herod pretty early on in the life of the church. But there was a second James. He was the son of Mary and of Joseph, uh, the half-brother of Jesus, who uh, very quickly became a, a pillar in the Jerusalem church, one of the central figures uh, in Christianity. And this was the same man who probably authored the book of James. This is the James uh, that Jude is talking about. Jude uh, was James's brother, and James, as we know from, from Acts, was the brother of Jesus. So Jude was written by uh, the brother of Jesus himself. And Jude could have chosen to introduce himself that way, but he doesn't. He chooses instead to call himself a slave of Jesus and a brother of James. And so as we as we hear the warnings about false teaching, 
uh, the warnings about the punishment for sin. I think Jude's humility should set the tone as we study this letter. Because this is not from a a self-righteous Pharisee who's a stickler for every point of the law, and if you slip up just a little bit, then he's going to hit you with some condemnation. Uh, As we will see, Jude has come to know Jesus as the only master and Lord of every Christian. And even even the master and Lord of someone like Jude, who grew up knowing Jesus as his older brother. Jude doesn't warn these churches about false teachers because of a puffed-up sense of his own pride. He's not trying to keep his place in the church, just exactly the opposite. He warns them because he has come to know Jesus and the importance of holding him uh, tightly by faith. But that's not enough to, to convince us of his intentions. He tells us exactly why he's writing this letter in verses 3 to 4. He says this, he says, Although I was very eager... Sorry, I don't have that one up. He says, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Jude, from wherever he is, has heard of a danger. And so he writes this letter to warn the churches about the false teachers who have slipped in. And from verse 5 onwards, Jude's letter will kind of follow a pattern. He, he warns of the dangers of the false teachers, and then he gives um, little things to help identify them. He describes how to recognize them. And he repeats this cycle a, a couple of times. He defines the danger, and then he exposes the identity of these false teachers. And this morning, like I said, instead of going straight through the letter, I just want us to focus on the first half of these cycles. Jude's warnings. Jude's warnings are, are, are startling, but they must be heard. Next week, we'll look a little bit at what might be the more encouraging half of the letter. We'll look at uh, Jude's uh, treatment and um, plan for action uh, to address the disease of these false teachers. But for this morning, I think we should take it slow while we hear his warning and take in the seriousness of the danger that, that still faces the church today. Jude's first warning of the danger of these false teachers is in verses 5 through 7. And he gives three examples from the Old Testament. With these examples, Jude reminds his readers of the consequences of abandoning God. I want to remind you, he says, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who has saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains of gloomy darkness until the day of judgment. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Jude's warning uses three examples uh, to keep his readers from a false sense of security. In verse 5, he reminds them that after saving the Hebrews from Egypt with signs and wonders, some of them were unfaithful in the desert, and they were later destroyed. So Jude warns his readers against a false sense of security by reminding them of the history of the nation of Israel. In the same way, these words are also a reminder to us, to remind us where we are in our journey of salvation. Right? Because the Hebrews leaving Egypt didn't go straight into the promised land, but they, they were led through the wilderness. And they were in the wilderness for uh, quite some time. We, we read earlier from, uh, from Moses that, that God told the people of Israel that he took them through the, the period of the wilderness and of wandering so that he might test them, to know what was in their hearts, to see whether they would keep his commandments or not. And it wasn't like God was setting them up to fail because as he took them through the wilderness, God took care of their every need. He gave them bread from heaven. He says in Deuteronomy that we read, to teach them that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So the question is, where are we in the story of our own salvation? If we could use Israel's history just as a a picture, where are we? Are we in Egypt or are we in the promised land, or are we in the wilderness? How much like the wilderness is our experience now? We have seen God move already. 
Maybe we can tell stories about what he has done. Maybe how he has delivered us, how he has fed us or protected us. But are we, are we in the promised land that we're looking forward to? Are we, we talked last week about the resurrection, how that is the, the end of our hope. I know we, we are waiting for a future day when we will be with him forever in paradise. So the, the warning comes to us from Jude. He, he says, not everyone who made it out of Egypt ends up in the promised land. Jude reminds us that the Israelites did not learn from God's provision what they were supposed to. The, the majority of them failed this test. Even after seeing God's power and being fed by bread from heaven. If you, if you read the history from Exodus to Numbers, you, over and over the, the people fail. They, some of them created an idol and, and worshipped it. Another man named Korah led a rebellion to try to overthrow Moses and, and God's appointed leaders. Some were even led by a, a prophet named Balaam to worship the pagan gods of their neighbors. And all of these who, who didn't believe, whether in God's promises that he would bring them into the land, whether to believe that he had chosen these people to lead them, whether to believe in, in his own greatness that there should be no other gods before him, all of those who chose not to believe in God, who chose to participate in abandoning him, were destroyed. And Jude brings us up to, to remind them uh, to remind his readers that, that some who made it out of Egypt never saw the promised land. Jude's reminder it is meant to shake a false sense of security from any among us who are sleeping. These examples should be warning bells to any of us who have found ourselves attending church for years just along for the ride. Don't assume that hanging around in the wilderness with this people who have come out of Egypt means that you will inherit the promise, Jude says. His, his reminder is, is piercing. Is the security you feel real? How do we know? I think Jude's words should be a little haunting for any of us who have spent significant time in the church. Maybe some of us who have gotten so used to certain truths that we sometimes move right past them. His warning, not everyone who made it out of Egypt ended up in the promised land. So is his, is his warning heard? You feel the weight of Jude's concern for these people, uh, of the Lord's concern for us. Jude, Jude wants to rid us of a false sense of security and to stamp us with a real sense uh, of the severity of the situation. And before we move on to look at the severity of the punishment that God gives, I just want to give a little note of grace that I think is packed into Jude's warning. Because if you are feeling the weight of Jude's warning, in it, and I hope we are, can I remind us of what happened at the greatest rebellion in the wilderness? There were these times of idolatry and rebellion. The people involved were punished. But what about when God brought Israel all the way through the wilderness? When they were ready to go into the promised land, and he, he told them to send some spies in, and so they sent 12. 12 went out, 12 came back, and, and 10 of the spies said, nope, we, we can't do this. They're huge. We're going to get destroyed. We'll, we'll get killed. It's just not going to happen. But two, Caleb and Joshua stood up in front of all of God's people and said, the, the Lord is with us. Don't fear them. Two of them had faith. Sadly, what we read is that all of the people side with the ten uh, who didn't trust God. You can read it. They, they sided with them so much that they, it says all the people wanted to stone Caleb and Joshua, the two who said, let's go and do this. The Lord will deliver us. So here's, here's the note of grace. Jude, in this same warning, that, that not everyone who made it out of Egypt got to the promised land reminds us of the condition for entering. What was the difference between the ten and the two spies? It was faith. Faith that God was with them, that he could do it. Jude does want to destroy any false sense of security we have that, that, will make us, that, that, that we will make it through the wilderness and into the promised land. But he doesn't want to destroy those false senses of security so that we will be constantly nervous until the day of our death, wondering if we'll be some of the ones who make it into the promised land or if we're going to die in the wilderness. 
I mean, this is a, a letter about being kept by God. Jude wants to destroy any false sense of security to give us a stronger grip on the only real source of our security, in God alone. This is what he said, that, that it was those who did not believe who were afterwards destroyed. Caleb and Joshua, who trusted that God could do it, they were brought safely into the promised land. So if, if you've been in church for all these years because you were born into it, or, or married into it, or maybe found a community of loving people through it, maybe you came forward at an altar call 40 years ago. These are wonderful. All of these things have been used and, and, and are used constantly by God for the salvation of his people. But they've also been used by our enemy to give a false sense of security for a salvation that has never happened. So let Jude's warning this morning have its, its full effect. Not all who made it out of Egypt walked into the promised land. Only those who had faith in God. Jude lays down such a hard warning with this first example because the next two are designed to give us a, a real sense of the severity of turning against God. Right? Not only does he mention the Hebrews who were destroyed in the wilderness because they did not believe, but, but Jude reminds us of the rebellious angels who were punished and the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah which were destroyed because of their sin. He talks about the angels who left their place. These were the ones who fell with Satan after trying to leave the position God had appointed for them. The Bible doesn't get much more clear than that. But the, their rebellion, Jude teaches, was punished by eternal chains of gloomy darkness. Cast out of the presence of God who is light, these angels wait in darkness for the final day of judgment. Also, the, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed for their unrighteousness. And even some of the surrounding cities that practiced the sin they did were destroyed with, Jude says, eternal fire. What's the common thread between these three examples, if not the severity of their punishment? Notice how, how both in, in both of these second examples, the punishment is final, meaning that judgment has been passed. Mercy is available to all for free until judgment comes. But once God's righteous judgment has been passed, his verdict is, is final. Look at the punishment of the angels in verse 6. He says that they are eternal chains. And for Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 7 is eternal fire. This is final judgment. This is not a a sermon on hell, but, but can we just take a second to see the, the reality with which Jude is, is presenting this to us? The, the reality of the punishment, Jude is warning. We use the word hell in English to speak of the place and the punishment that Jude is describing. And the severity of the punishment is part of Jude's warning. He warns us of a punishment that is at the same time pictured with Fire and darkness, two things that, that don't really go together for us. But somehow this punishment has both of these horrible realities. Uh, unending gloom and yet surrounded by consuming flames. If any of us are, are tempted just to wash away the Bible's teaching of hell by calling it uh, symbolic language, can we just ask the question, what do symbols do? unless they are to describe what is otherwise indescribable. This is a real warning. Symbols are used to describe a real danger. Not only does Jude warn them of holding on to a false sense of security, but, but he's reminding them with these examples in order to give them a real sense of the severity of this punishment. Jude's first warning shakes any false sense of security that the church might have. And, and his other examples underline the real sense of severity for the punishment of abandoning God. And in verses 12 through 13, Jude finally warns the church about the subtlety of false teachers. I think he's so heavy on these realities that we know from Scripture because uh, the teachers that have slipped into the church are so subtle 
in the way they, they twist things. In verses 12 through 13, Jude pictures these false teachers as, as things that often remain hidden until it is too late. In Jesus' words, they are wolves in sheep's clothing, but, but Jude provides us pictures of these false teachers to give us, as his readers, a, a heightened sense of their subtlety. Just re- read along with me from verse 12 and, and hear how Jude describes these people. He says, These people are hidden reefs at your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear. Shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Hidden reefs and waterless clouds, fruitless trees in in late autumn. These pictures are are meant to get us thinking. What is the danger of a hidden reef for a ship? That that without realizing it, they would drive the ship up onto the rock and, and shatter the, the hole and, and be dragged down into the sea as, as the ship sinks. What is the danger of, of waterless clouds other than empty promises that stir up hope only to, to dash the hope to pieces or maybe to, to wither the hope up when, when the clouds are blown away without a drop of rain? What is the danger of, of fruitless trees in late autumn not just the, the empty promises of the waterless clouds, but also the, the sudden danger of the hidden reef. They, they come together in this image. Just imagine the, the farmer who has an orchard. Right? And he's, he's tending his orchard. And, and with each passing day through the, the harvest, he's waiting to see the fruit. And as each day ends, the, the uneasy feeling in his stomach grows and grows until one day the, the, the time for harvest has, has come and gone. And his fruit trees have still given nothing. In the meantime, there's been no chance to plant anything else because of the the care these trees needed. And so disaster comes slowly but still suddenly as he realizes all too late that his trees are going to give him nothing for the winter. What is the danger of allowing false teachers into the fellowship of the church? What is the danger of listening to the ministry of people like Jude's opponents? The danger is that the disaster they may bring will be just as sudden as the sound of a ship grating over the reef. Their promise is just as empty as as the waterless clouds, leaving a community thirsty for the real fountain of life in Jesus Christ. For some, the the warning will come too late. They'll give their lives to cultivating this kind of soft thing that looks like Christianity but really is no Christianity at all and the the promises of these teachers will never bear everlasting fruit because they were always disconnected from the everlasting source of life in Christ. Twice dead, fruitless and, and uprooted at the end of autumn. These these pictures make it clear what Jude meant when he said back at the beginning Uh, He said, I I found it necessary to write to you, appealing to you to contend for the faith, once for all delivered, for certain people have crept in unnoticed. The danger of false teachers is not that they loudly knock on the door wearing a shirt that says, I deny Jesus Christ. The danger of false teachers is that they can slip in unnoticed. Paul tells us in his letter to Timothy that that false teachers will come in the last days preaching a message that soothes the itching ears of the people. Paul Paul says outright what what Jude kind of understands but doesn't really say. Paul says the reason that these teachers have a following is because the people not only tolerate it, but deep down they, they want it. It is their own ears that they want scratched. Paul, in his letters, is speaking to a young pastor, Timothy, to to keep a watch over his teaching and make sure he doesn't stray into error. But Jude is giving a warning to churches. Jude says he he found it necessary to appeal to you. This doesn't quite come through in English as well unless we say something like y'all or yous. 
Right? He, he's talking to multiple people. In, in Greek, you is plural. The warning is to y'all. And so the responsibility is to y'all to contend for the faith. The Bible might charge elders with the task of shepherding and, and keeping an eye out for wolves and bears that threaten to destroy the flock of God, but the Bible in no way expects the church to be passive in this ministry. And Jude writes to a, to a whole body to warn them of the danger of these false teachers, to remind them that, that those who made it out of Egypt but who did not enter the promised land did not believe that God was the one who was able to do it. Jude writes for these people to, to keep themselves in the love of Christ, even as he tells them that God will keep them until that final day. And so while there is warning here, the warning is meant to shake us from our false foundations and root us only in Christ. He writes to warn us of the danger of false teaching. His description of, of the consequences of abandoning God give us a real sense of the severity of doing this. His pictures of the false teachers give us a, a heightened sense of how subtle they are. And all of these things work together to, to create a picture of a danger that is very real and very persistent in the church. So from this church, may we not ever forget this ever-present danger. Don't, don't forget the, the y'all that Jude uses, that the responsibility to contend for the faith is with you. We've, we've, heard, Jude's, we've heard Jude's warning this morning, I hope. We've heard the, the grace that there is in Christ, the one who will keep us until that day. So let me just close with Jude's ending. He says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority from before all time and now and forever. Almighty God, by your Spirit, would you give us ears to hear your warning this morning? Would you keep us in your love? And in that final day, may we be found to stand before you unashamed by Christ who saves us. Shake from us any false foundations, any security that should not be there, and, and set our feet firmly on the foundation of Christ. Keep us kept. We pray in his name. Amen.